Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the quantitative reasoning section of the UCAT. So this is going to be the third section of the UCAT and it basically involves maths, arithmetic and sort of occasionally reading some tables and graphs to solve questions. So about 40 seconds a question and personally I found that this was the most time pressured section throughout the entire test. By a mile. So throughout my entire study for quantitative reasoning I was consistently doing awful. I was doing say sometimes 400, sometimes 500, it's maybe a top of about 600 um, until about the last two weeks where I sort of intensely focused just on the quantitative reasoning section and I eventually ended up scoring 800 in the UCAT for the section which was my highest score throughout all sections. So the first thing I'll say about quantitative reasoning is throughout your entire study you need to take note of every single formula that you encounter. I've made a sort of wee example here. So speed, distance, time is one of the sort of main formulas that you will encounter in pretty much most of the exams. And I've written a wee shorthand thing here, which I will explain in a wee minute. So the initial main take home is that you're gonna have to take note of every formula that you sort of encounter throughout your study. To build on this, in between each section in the UCAT, you have a one minute sort of rest gap. Don't use it as a rest. What you should be doing is writing down every single formula that you've encountered and that you've memorised. So for me, for example, I had about, I think maybe six or seven formulas I would write down in every single sort of minute gap before the, the section would start. And I'll do them exactly how I did it here. that I would write in the one minute before my exam right there what I will do is I'll attach maybe a photo of all of them and what they are maybe if that would be helpful um, because I did refer to them quite a lot throughout the exam and I found it was really helpful if I couldn't think of the, the formula exactly I would look down sort of carry out the working here and write out the numbers sort of like here and I'd get the answer and that would be me. Oh my god, what is that? Yeah. Oh my god! What is that? So the main difference about the quantitative reasoning is this will be the first time you really have to use the calculator in the exam. So the calculator, just for reference, you can bring up by pressing Alt and C together and this will bring up the calculator on the screen and then you can use the number pad to punch in any numbers and do sort of any calculations that you wouldn't be able to do in your head. The one thing I say about the calculator is, and sort of studying for the, the quantitative reasoning is, if you are able to, I would get a sort of separate keyboard, a computer keyboard, that you're able to use a number pad, because going across the, the sort of long line of numbers to try and punch in the numbers, or by using the mouse, it is quite slow. And ideally what you do want is to get quite fast at the number pads and where everything is. So if possible, get yourself a keyboard, I don't know if you have a computer in your house already or you can get them on Amazon for I think like a tenner so it's not too bad but I would definitely recommend it because the test centre uses a keyboard that you can use a number pad and the Alt-C together. Another thing about the calculator that I found throughout my sort of few months of study is that if you use the calculator for every single question from start to finish to fill out every single little sum you will run out of time. You don't have enough time to sort of meticulously go through every single some even like four times three uh, at some points i'd be like four times three getting the answer and then building on it the calculator doesn't have any memory so it can't use the sort of previous answer to a sum that can, you can then sort of apply to the next question so it is a case of using the calculator wisely you can't use it too much you have to almost treat it as if one thing i would say to myself before the exam started is the quantitative reasoning section is essentially just a verbal reasoning section with some sums and with some times that you're going to have to use a calculator. I don't know how accurate that is, but it definitely took my mindset away from constantly using the calculator. So I'm not too sure how well I explained that, but essentially an example of what I mean by sort of half using the calculator, half not using the calculator is, so say we had a question like this, notice that this is still here and I kept this sort of strip like this the entire exam. So I could constantly refer to it if I was doing the working on sort of this half of the board. So say we've got a window frame here and the question is saying, find the area of the, the whole window here, but the only measurements we have here is seven and eight. So obviously we're going to be able to initially calculate this shaded part by using the formula eight equals LB. Then we've got seven times eight, which is 56, obviously. So that part, we've, 
most of us anyway would be able to do it in our head. Um, under the time pressure of the exam, I don't know why, but usually I felt like my, my maths was on it a wee bit more than, than usual anyway. So we've got the first half of the question is 56. So what they usually try and do with questions like this is the answers would be sort of along the lines of 56, maybe 112, 200, or then it would be the correct answer, which is 220 something. To say, I think it's 226. I don't even have a calculator on me. Just, let's just say the bottom one's the correct answer here. So we've got 56 here. And then if we did need to do 56 times 4, obviously it's quite oh, difficult to do in your head. brother, this guy stinks! 224. That should be the answer, I think. Um, so right, so we've got the, the, we've done eight times seven in our head, and then we have to find the area of the entire window frame here. So we've got 56, and then we're obviously gonna need to times that by four. So then at this point, I would do control C. Instantly on the right hand side, I would be punching in 56 times four on the, the number pad, and I would get quite fast at it at this point. Then it would give me the answer of 224. That's obviously going to be our final answer here. So that's what I did for the majority of my study and sort of almost up until the last couple of weeks before the exam. But then I found out sort of the, the, the whole idea of guesstimating in the UCAT. And I think this is honestly one of the reasons why I managed to do so well in the quantitative reasoning side of things is because I almost barely relied on the calculator what I mean by this is, in our head we've got 56, we've done 8 times 7 and we've got 56 for one of the four window frames. We've got four window frames here, so in my head straight away I know I've got to do 56 times 4. Instead of going into the calculator, control C, 56 times 4 equals getting the answer and looking over. What I would do is look at the answer straight away. If we've got 56 times 4, we know straight away 50 times 4 is going to be over 200. So we look at the answers here, we, are, we can already tell it it's going to be 224 because it's going to be bigger than 200, if that makes sense. The 56, you can tell, is there for people that sort of instantly just go 8 times 7. I don't have much time, I'm just going to go and put 8 times 7 in and that's going to be it. They're going to click that. Some of the answers they've got totally wrong and I think that's just for people sort of guessing and going through it as much as they can. 200 they've got there sort of as a, as a, like a relatively convincing answer, but we can tell without even using the calculator, it's going to be straight away bigger than 200 because we've still got the 6 on top of the 50 to times by 4. And then we've got the the answer at the bottom here. I hope 56 times 4 is 224. It's 224. Good. Just a random tip for guessing. Um, I, I saw during my study that somebody had said, if you do have to guess, say if you have 15 seconds and you've got 5 questions to go, 6 questions to go, whatever, Statistically, you are more likely to get them right if you choose sort of A six times or B six times instead of going like A, C, B, D just randomly. If you guess A for all of them, B for all of them, C for all of them, D for all of them, etc., you are statistically more likely to get some of them right. So that's just something to keep in mind, if specifically for quantitative reasoning, because that's when I would run out of time towards the end. Like throughout some of my mocks, I would have like, like honestly, about 12. To 15 questions unanswered at some point. So another thing to be mindful of with the quantitative reasoning section is by looking at the answers. So say just for a random question, the answer was sort of 136.5. That is what they would sometimes put the answers like. So you'd get 13.65, the answer obviously here, a weird decimal point here, and sort of 1,365, they, would, they quite commonly try and not be out that are trying to go quite quickly through it by putting the decimal point but using the same numbers, if that makes sense. So it is quite important to know, if you are going through it, be mindful about being really meticulous about where the bullet point is and if it's the exact correct sort of, um, the correct number that you've got. So I mentioned this one a little bit earlier, but what I would say is almost treat the quantitative reasoning like verbal reasoning. And I know it sounds stupid because it is totally different and the entire premise of this section is really different. But what you should be doing, if you have a question that is sort of set out like, we've got a big table here and we've got all the information in the table. We've got a big paragraph here. I mean, first of all, that'd be getting skipped so hard. I would not be doing that question, but say for a question that you think is doable. In this entry text here, what they do sometimes is they'll say, for every four apples you buy, you get 25% off. 
something like that. So then instead of just doing the price of an apple times four, what you would then have to do is get the answer to this and then you would have to times it by 0 0.25 or 0 0.75, sorry, to find the, the, the answer with 25% off. And then you would have this here. So it is important to read the text at the start. And that's what I mean by almost treat it like a verbal reasoning section because the text at the start is vital and it does, it will like totally change the answer as well. I'd say the last thing that I would say about quantitative reasoning is, again, linking to the time, as you get closer to the test throughout the, the quantitative reasoning and all other sections alike, you will know what questions you're good at and what questions you're not good at. In quantitative reasoning, for me, just as I mentioned with that question there, that absolutely massive sort of text, then a table, and then answer some questions off it. If there was any questions to do with tax, because they do sort of a tax thing, and then you have to apply different percentage offs and percentages and discounts and tax brackets with each tax bracket. And honestly, skip it straight away. Do not do tax questions. Unless you are really good at maths and you find quantitative reasoning extremely easy, it was not me, if you find this section really easy, go for it. Just skip the tax questions. If you see them, alt n. Don't even flag it, just go. Just just, just run, don't do it. Anything sort of to do with times. I found some of the journey times. I did get a few of these um, throughout my study and they are quite common throughout the sort of whole process of the UCAP. But a lot they do sort of train times. I found these huge questions. Unless I had time, I would just skip them because you can get far easier questions. Like you can get easy sort of speed distance time questions. You can get easy questions instead of having to faff about with the trains to here and then the times and the arrival times and the wait times. I would skip these and come back to them at the end if I did have time. And I'd say last of all, just huge questions. Ones with the huge blocks of text, the huge tables, just skip them. You can come back to them at the end if you have time, but your time is more valuable with an easier question that's say like error equals length times spread, speed equals distance time, etc, etc. Use your time wisely, you don't have a lot of it and sort of you are better off to do the easier questions and come back to the hard questions and guarantee yourself a few right answers at least. So as with all these videos, I will include my notes as I was going before the exam in the description, as I have done with the previous ones. And I'll also try and include a formula sheet. Um, obviously they're not all the formulas, but they're the formulas that I remembered and the formulas that I struggled with. And the ones that, as I say, I just kept here. I wrote them in the minute before the exam, before the quantitative reasoning section started, I wrote them here and I did it religiously throughout all my mocks. I would keep them here constantly and I'll include these formulas as well, just so that you guys can do it as well. Hope this video's helped. As always, any suggestions, tell me. Um, I can make a video on it. I'm quite open to making any sort of video at this point as we are quite early in the stages of this thing. Um, I'll do abstract reasoning very soon. Very soon, not as long as last time, but very soon.